Thank you all for staying. Thank you to Mort and John for uh, inviting me to speak and for the MEDEX group for putting on this talk. And we will do our best to make this valuable for you all. And we appreciate you staying for the last session today. I will be going over treatment of double hit and double protein expressor lymphomas. There are my disclosures. I will first be covering the diagnosis of these entities, followed by the treatment. And then there are a number of important issues that come up with these patients, including CNS prophylaxis and the role of stem cell transplant. And then finally, I will go over a couple of new uh, therapeutic strategies in particular that we are um, focusing on at Cornell. The WHO classification of lymphoid neoplasms in 2016 included three distinct groups. Um, one was DLBCL NOS, and this was the first time that the germinal center and then ABC, activated B cell or non-germinal center types were broken into two different descriptions under that category, as well as the co-expression of MYC and BCL2 proteins as double protein lymphomas, double expressor lymphomas um, as a prognostic marker, which I'll address in just a bit. And then a new category was made called high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6 translocations, and that is what we call double-hit lymphoma. Very wordy title, so double-hit has stuck with that. And then another category called high-grade B-cell lymphoma and OS. The double and triple-hit lymphomas are defined by chromosomal translocations involving MYC, BCL2, and or BCL6. Uh, D, the double hits are most commonly MYC and BCL2 rearranged with about 60 to 80 percent of cases uh, that fall into that category, and then a smaller percentage, about 10 to 20 percent, are MYC and BCL6 rearranged. Triple hit lymphomas have all three rearranged and make up the rest of the uh, proportion of those uh, that fall in that category. They're characterized by refractoriness to standard chemotherapy. The overall survival is 5 to 24 months when they're treated with RCHOP. Extranodal involvement is more common than in classical DLBCL, and uh, the incidence is estimated at 5 to 10 percent for double hit and then 1 percent for triple hit. Double protein expressor lymphomas are characterized by the expression of, of MYC and BCL2 by immunohistochemistry without the gene rearrangements. And the typical cutoffs that are used are greater than or equal to 40 percent uh, for MYC and then 50 percent for BCL2. It is, of course, more common than the double hits. Uh, one large study showed that about a third of patients with DLBCL had, uh, had a double protein expression. And it's an indicator of a less favorable prognosis than standard DLBCL, but it is not a separate category in the WHO 2016, as I just showed. And I have a slide here um, with one of the studies that has, has um, demonstrated this data looking at overall survival. The top curve is the, top, is the uh, classical DLBCL. Um, the red are the double expressors. And then the purple at the bottom are the double hit lymphoma. So you can see the difference in um, prognosis based on that. Uh, most double hit lymphomas are germinal center type, and the double expressors tend to be ABC subtype. This is from Jonathan Freeberg's How I Treat uh, article on double hit lymphoma uh, that was published last year. And I encourage you all to look at this uh, article from David Scott um, that was published earlier in 2018. Um, there's some really interesting data. This is really the largest uh, set of pathological information that is published, to my knowledge, um, on double hit lymphomas. And really, part of the, the effort was to try to come up with a strategy of which patients should be screened for double hit lymphomas with fish testing. And I don't think the answer is, is clear at this point, but this does show you um, it confirms a lot of the information that I've had on prior slides. You can see that uh, in the top. Um, let's see, I'll use this as a pointer if I can. Um, the orange cases here are the um, germinal center, so there certainly were more um, double hit cases that were germinal center than the blue, which are the ABC or non-GCB. And then interestingly, um, so they looked at 1,200 cases, and about 12% of them had MYC rearrangement. So at the bottom here, you could see um, the MYC positive and then MYC BCL2 positive, and then this is um, gene rearrangements, MYC BCL6 rearrangements, and then MYC BCL2 and BCL6. So you can see certainly that the germinal center for double traditional double hit, the MYC BCL2 rearranged, and then the triple hits are germinal center. There are some um, of the MYC BCL6 rearranged that are ABC subtype. 
Um, and I actually had a patient with that pretty recently. Uh, so the big picture is that certainly if someone has germinal center type and the double expression of MYC and BCL2, you should definitely be checking uh, for the FISH uh, testing in those patients. And I would say also if you see MYC and BCL6 positive in, a, uh, in an ABC patient, that you really should think about doing that too. This is data on RCHOP versus our EPOC uh, in all DLBCL newly diagnosed Alliance 5033 study, which was presented by Nancy Bartlett a couple of years ago at ASH. And I think we're, we're expecting um, manuscript relatively soon in that. And um, this showed the overall response rates and uh, CR rates very similar between the RCHOP and dose-adjusted EPOC R regimens. So for most patients, the RCHOP regimen remains standard in newly diagnosed DLBCL patients. You can see these um, event-free and overall survival curves at the bottom. Um, however, knowing um, that the uh, double hit patients often do very poorly and that this study really did not have enough uh, likely patients with double hit to be able to draw conclusions based on some retrospective data, we are recommending, uh, and it really is the standard of care, um, to be giving dose-adjusted EPOC-R in double hit and triple hit patients. Oh, uh, this is a slide courtesy of John Leonard, actually, which um, shows um, the RCHOP versus dose-adjusted EPOC-R regimens, which I believe this audience knows well. And the double expressor lymphomas, I want to make the point, um, still should be treated with RCHOP times six. Um, there is really insufficient data to support a more aggressive regimen in those patients. Uh, but the double hit and triple hit should be treated with dose-adjusted EPOC-R, as I list here and I will go through a couple of studies. Uh, there were two retrospective studies, and there are a few others as well. These are the largest ones. Um, the top uh, two figures here correspond to a study by uh, Petrich, um, which looked at about 300 patients with double hit uh, and triple hit lymphomas, looking at different regimens. This, again, was retrospective, uh, multi-center, um, and you can see at the uh, bottom of this, um, RCHOP, hyper CVAD, dose-adjusted EPOC-R, codox M, R IVAC, and some other regimens. And the highest CR rates were seen um, with dose-adjusted EPOC-R. And then if you look at the progression-free survival of all of the intense regimens compared to RCHOP, the patients who had received one of the more intense um, did have a higher progression-free survival compared to RCHOP. At the bottom are some curves from the MD Anderson data set. This did include some double expressors, um, but primarily double hit and um, triple hit patients, and that they looked at similar regimens. Again, retrospective study, a little bit smaller than the other. Um, the dose-adjusted epoch R is in blue, and you can see the EFS and overall survival were uh, better compared to all the other regimens. So it's primarily based on this retrospective data. And a, and a few other studies, uh, also small, um, that form the basis of us uh, using this regimen for this disease, which, again, tends to be uh, less responsive than uh, the classical DLBCL. I want to touch on CNS relapse. So I did mention to you that extranodal involvement is more common um, in double hit lymphomas in particular compared to classical DLBCL. And so the CNS relapse in all DLBCL is about 5%. Risk and then um, the double hit, and this actually incidence um, of, of uh, th this data is really applying to incidence of double um, expressor and double hit patients having CNS involvement, and it, it could also be at baseline um, based on again, there, there's a limited amount of data to pull from, but these were the best numbers I could find for that. So around 10 to 13 percent, so a higher risk there. The timing is usually within two years from initial diagnosis. That's in general for CMS relapse um, in DLBCL. And the median survival of these patients um, is about four months after CNS relapse is detected. And um, we're going to hear from Dr. Rubinson in just a bit about, uh, about management of CNS lymphoma um, and also secondary. Um, I'm going to list the CNS IPI here. and. Um, just of note that particularly high-risk sites for CNS relapse are kidney and adrenal gland involvement, and then um, just in general having greater than one extranodal site. So there's some other factors here, but I think these particular high-risk sites are, are ones that we should pay attention to. I've also listed some of them at the bottom, testes, breast, paranasal sinuses, the paraspinal area, and then the bone marrow. Uh, so this is the Petrich study that I mentioned just a bit ago, showing that CNS prophylaxis and double hit lymphoma is associated with improved overall survival in patients who did not have baseline CNS disease. Um, this shows um, patients who received methotrexate com um, containing prophylaxis and an overall survival curve at the top. Um, these pe people did better. Of course, the ones who had CNS disease positive from baseline had the worst survival. 
Uh, but I do recommend that patients with double hit and triple hit lymphomas should certainly undergo MRI and lumbar puncture to assess whether they have CNS involvement at baseline. Uh, typically, it's very toxic to give high-dose method trexate along with dose-adjusted EPOC-R, so I'd recommend that you give somewhere between three and six doses of intrathecal methotrexate with, e with cycles of dose-adjusted EPOC-R. That's based on Jeremy Abramson's data published in Cancer, I think back in 2010, um, cited here. And um, for those patients, you, if, you, if they do have particularly high-risk sites, you would want to strongly consider giving the high-dose methotrexate at the end of the R epoch. Now, of course, this is going to depend on patient factors. For example, older patients may not have poor renal function or may really have a hard time even getting through the epoch R. And this is a prophylactic strategy, so we want to weigh um, the risks and benefits in each individual patient. But again, certainly young people um, that have these high-risk sites, I think that you really want to consider giving some high-dose methotrexate at the end of the R epoch. The role and timing of stem cell transplant in double hit and triple hit lymphoma is not clear. I'm showing two studies, again, the same that I've referred to before, um, that looked at um, transplant. And did, did this, again, was retrospective, so looking at transplant um, at any time. So 83 of the about 300 patients from the Petrick study um, had stem cell transplant. Most of them were autos. And then uh, <laughs> most of them were done in CR1, um, and pretty similar information with the uh, in the Anderson data set that um, that uh, most of them who went underwent <clears throat> transplant did so in CR1, and most of them were autos. You can see both these are overall survival curves, and there was not a statistically significant difference in either. Uh, the bottom figure is from Alex Herrera's study a couple years ago that looked at all patients with DLBCL in the second CR, and they separated out the double hit cases, and they found here that patients who had double hit uh, versus, um, I'm sorry, double hit's the yellow at the bottom versus the non-double hit, um, double hit still had a very poor overall survival, even though they went, they went through the transplant in the standard of care. So transplant is probably not the answer for these patients, and we really want to focus on novel therapeutic strategies. That leads me on to my next slide. So this is an important research area for me, and I've correlated um, with uh, uh, Dr. Leandro Cherchietti, who you heard uh, from this morning on some clinical trials that we really want to improve the outcomes in this patient population. First, the obvious strategy would be to target BCL2 MYC or BCL6. This hasn't always been so easy to target MYC, although there are um, some interesting trials going on with a MYC-directed um, inhibitor. I'm going to mention um, a trial with the uh, Venetoclax BCL2 inhibitor. And then, uh, secondly, there are some alternative protein networks that are involved um, in double hit pathogenesis, um, specifically XPO1 and EIF4E, which I'll go over, um, are targets that uh, will hopefully be useful in uh, double hit lymphomas. This is a trial that I've been running along with Jeremy Abramson, who's the overall study PI of Venetoclax plus dose-adjusted epoch are a newly diagnosed DLBCL. This is not specific just to uh, double hit patients. This has been a dose-finding study to lead to a second trial, which would focus more on the double hit and double protein expressure um, populations with venetoclax in combination with chemotherapy. Um, so the primary objective of this study is to determine the maximum tolerated dose of this combination. The venetoclax uh, has been given on 10 days of each cycle, um, just for the six cycles, and that then it is finished uh, along with the chemotherapy. And then, of course, they're evaluating toxicities, response rate, and EFS 12. Um, we've enrolled 18 patients, and we're actually um, in, uh, planning on an additional dosing and expansion cohort, and then a follow-up phase two study that I've already mentioned, which we run through the alliance. The target I want to talk about next is Exportin-1, and this is a, a major nuclear export protein of tumor suppressor proteins and oncogenic mRNAs, MYC, BCL2, and BCL6. It acts in cancer cells to inactivate tumor suppressor proteins by extruding them from the nucleus and also contributing to cell proliferation. Uh, this is some data from Leandro's lab, um, and I want you to focus on the red. So these are the, the cells that are expressing XPO1 the most. And this is newly diagnosed cases, and the, these are patients who had a response to frontline therapy here on the left, and then on the right, a relapse and refractory. And you can see that a lot of the relapse and refractory cases overexpress XPO1. And there is an oral drug called Selenexor, which is an inhibitor of XPO1. 
and I have been running a trial at Cornell in the second line setting of Selenex or plus rice in um, aggressive B cell lymphomas. Um, this is also a dose finding study. And um, the way that the um, trial is, is being dosed is rice is given on day one and then dexamethasone, which is thought to have synergistic effects with Selenexor, is given um, on many of the days, days one through five and then day seven. And then we're dosing Selenexor three times, days three, five, and seven of each cycle. And again, we're working closely with Leandra to collect samples at baseline, blood, and tumor. Um, and then after, some, after the chemotherapy is given before the Selenexor and then after the Selenexor. And the last target that I wanted to discuss is called the eukaryotic translation initiation factor 4E or EIF4E. And this actually works uh, on the same mRNAs that I've mentioned, which are obviously relevant to my discussion, MCBCL2 and BCL6. This acts in two different places. It acts in the cytoplasm, which it helps to uh, export the mRNAs from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And then in the cytoplasm, it helps to translate these mRNAs into protein. And interestingly, let's see if I can get these here, um, EIF4E is overexpressed in double and triple and hit lymphomas. So again, the red here, um, we know that, um, that double and triple hit lymphomas are making up a pretty small proportion, but of, of the, the patients that were um, done, that some correlative studies were done in Leandro's lab, um, there were a number of them um, that overexpressed EIF4E that were double and triple hit. And then I have a couple of, of laboratory data in a patient-derived xenograft model of triple hit lymphomas showing that ribavirin, which is an FDA-approved antiviral drug, um, can actually inhibit EIF4E. This is also based on some data that, and a couple of clinical trials that have been done in leukemia um, with ribavirin. And you can see that the tumor volume was decreased in, the, in these uh, PDX models that were treated with ribavirin. And at the bottom, you see the same, and actually, ideally, in the double hits, knowing that these are very aggressive lymphomas, one drug is likely not going to work well. So ideally, a combination, and in this case, an HSP90 inhibitor plus ribavirin resulted in an even de further decrease in tumor volume um, in uh, the triple hit PDX model. Uh, and I believe, actually, Let's see, I'm going to go back one side if I can. Okay, I just wanted to mention that we have a pilot investigator initiated study with ribavirin and B cell lymphomas that is currently enrolling at Wall Cornell. Uh, we are actually focusing on indolent lymphomas in the single agent trial for the reasons that I mentioned that uh, a single agent um, is not likely to be effective in, in the double hit and very aggressive lymphomas, but we're getting experience with this drug and hoping to move forward with further studies with this um, target in the future. And I will conclude with a treatment summary. For double and triple hit lymphomas, uh, the treatment of, uh, we would recommend would be dose-adjusted epoch r times 6. For double protein expressors would be R-CHOP times 6. For those with high-risk sites for CNS relapse, IT methotrexate during the dose-adjusted epoch r and consider high-dose methotrexate after completion. And again, you really want to be looking for the, the CNS involvement in these patients. Uh, because they tend to have a higher incidence than in the, the uh, general patient population with DLBCL. And then stem cell transplant, at this point, is in, there's insufficient evidence to support doing that in CR1. And I know there were, there were um, very good talks this morning about CAR T cells, so that would be the type of approach that we may consider in, in these patients. And in general, enrolling them on clinical trials with novel agents from any point, just like Jonathan said um, just a bit ago with mantle cell, I feel strongly about the double hit patients um, that really is advantageous for them to go on clinical trials at any point in their course to give them the best chance of, of uh, good outcomes. Thank you all for your attention, and I'll have time for a couple questions.